uh, you know, the artisans. We have three representatives of artisans on the board who have a say in, every, in, in company decisions. And then they are also empowered enough to spur it off in more areas, uh, you know, uh, across that region. So that's how we are scaling up. Ashwin, you have been very successful in scaling up, but you did mention a couple of times that it's been challenging. Right. What's been the biggest challenge as you've decided to grow big? Uh, just a point about uh, what these gentlemen uh, referred to, the, the multi-stakeholder involvement, uh, you know, public-private partnerships, uh, contribution or support from equity or uh, private equity venture capital fund. I think my belief is, as an organization, the organization has to deliver what Shankar Narayan mentioned, results and demonstrate that it's a viable business by itself. We work with government agencies, you know, micro health insurance programs, MFIs, we work, we have private equity investors. But fundamentally, if we rely too much on any of these components, whether it is public private uh, relationships, we have suffered a lot. When you rely on a government agency or an external agency, we have suffered. For example, we work with the um, health insurance programs of governments of Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. In Andhra Pradesh, we do phenomenally well. In Karnataka, it is a pain. We have to scale back when we work with agencies which, which are not, you know, probably aligned with, with, uh, with our kind of... Uh, Why is it a pain there? Uh, health insurance is still an evolving uh, sort of, um, you know, subject. So I think the state government is still trying to figure out how to manage it uh, uh, properly. So you're not getting the support from the state government? That's right, that's right. So that is one part. So if you, if you look at all the issues that we, uh, that we deal with, I think over-reliance on external help, you know, in some way is, 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 I think is not a very good idea. I think if the business is good, all this help will come. The second part is uh, about the biggest challenge, I think, when you, when you grow from a uh, sort of a semi-sustainable business to a scalable uh, or go to the scalable mode, I think the single biggest challenge is human resource. I think that's a part, that's the component that we have not been able to address um, fairly uh, successfully. And uh, I think there is a lot of work required there, both at the senior leadership level and al also at the managerial, mid-managerial and, uh, and ground level. Harold, you've seen, you've been in this area also for a very, very long time. You've seen a number of businesses from birth till the time they've grown. You've taken, and this is really impressive, a number of businesses from the time when they were asking for financial grants to the time when they're offering really robust uh, financial returns. How have you done that? Is there any one particular quality these businesses should have or pursue? Or if you had to give the most important piece of advice to an entrepreneur who's trying to grow bigger, what would that be? Uh, <clears throat> That's a very good question. I would say it's uh, be very careful about how, first, how much growth you do, how fast, how you blend the different components. I couldn't agree more about human resources uh, until you've got at least a minimally passable management team uh, to take on a lot of capital, especially fully commercial capital, is almost always asking for trouble. I guess going back to the evolution of any of these businesses, to reach the millions of people you'll have to in India, you're going to have to deal with what's clearly a market failure, meaning these businesses take even the best microfinance institutions or the most commercial. They all came from grants. Uh, they were early on. Uh, that changed over time. But there's very little in the development field uh, that does not need a mix of citizen sector, grant money, private smarts, and probably those mix over, t those change over time. I would say that the, the cases we've had that went off the tracks were ones that either grew too fast or got off mission or didn't have the management team in place and took on too much commercial funding. You know, frankly, my own evolution, I'm going through a lot of the same pressures. I have worked 30 years in the private investing arm of the World Bank Group, the IFC. And so I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm a full believer in investing in private business and the beauty of the marketplace. Um, but then I've had a three-year pilot as an independent where I've been had the complete luxury of being entirely grant funded. Yeah. That is winding to a close quickly. And now I'm going to be now funded from a set of commercial investors. But I'm also saying that I'll only go ahead to the extent I have a reasonable proportion of grant funding. And I can, that will let me stick to the mission and do the capacity building of these organizations. 
Otherwise, I'll just be another fund competing with some of our panelists for the same project. I say what we try to do is have a clear success metric, which is how many of our graduates and clients get picked up by fully commercial players. So then they can deal with them commercially. But uh, I think it's in that gray zone, which is big and important in a country like India, between inception stage and full commercial viability that we get tripped up. I guess that's a long-winded answer to your question, which is keep a smart and dynamic planning process. Make sure that you, with the company's management, is continuing to reevaluate, change the mix, how much commercial money, how to structure the private inputs relative to the subsidies, be open and transparent about the need for subsidies, don't kick it under the rug. All of those are kind of, a, I could show you the bruises, let's say, on my, on my own back from, let's say, uh, not doing that. Uh, so again, there's no real easy answer. I, I would say the critical need to involve private people in this even before the enterprise is co fully commercial, uh, that's the best way to regulate this. The problem is when the private people come as fully uh, rent-seeking investors, they tend also to drop their balance and judgment about what the mix is. So you really need to bring private discipline without a unduly private approach into these enterprises and keep adjusting. So you use the discipline that a corporate would probably use and apply those sort of principles, that discipline? Yes. Is, yeah. If you think of the best thing about a private company, it's got a planning and governance environment with smart folks who are you could also show examples where this went off the track, even in my country. Uh, but in general, a private business, it's, uh, it, it's led and governed. And that decision-making process is living and breathing. And it, may, it adjusts all the time. The road is never like it looks uh, more than three months ahead. That's where a lot of the social enterprises and the citizen sectors has some trouble, because donor money comes with very funny boxes and restrictions around it. And they want to do this and just this and that for a long time. And, God help you if you have to go back and make an adjustment before your five-year window is open. That's a very hard thing to do when you're trying to follow this winding road. You know, when we've talked about HR, the challenge, it's come up already quite a few times that the biggest challenge is HR. I want to open it up to all of you here. Has anybody else experienced that? I actually um, don't think it's, it's such a big problem. Because uh, while, yes, definitely, say, in the deserts of Rajasthan or the hills of Himachal, you may not have very educated people, but sometimes that's useful. Uh, sometimes that's a boon. Because you have people, uh, I was just saying this, you know, you invest a little bit in training, in capacity building, and there's such a hunger and such a drive to do something, to create something out of nothing, that, uh, that, that you don't necessarily need people with degrees and that kind of training. It can be training on the job is the best training. You just need to invest that little time. So I wanted to ask you, I'm personally curious. You work uh, you know, on a very hands-on uh, uh, level with the artisans. As you've grown bigger, has it impacted them personally, their lives in any way? How has it changed for them? Yeah, uh, both good and bad. The good thing is, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, that uh, in the villages we work, the younger generation, especially the young women, want to take up crafts as, uh, as, a, way of, uh, as, as a way of earning, as a way of expression. So it's, an, it's becoming, uh, I think, I like to think an aspirational career choice. And you know, it's not something that you just did sitting at home as a hobby. That, that there is something. So that's on the one hand, that's there. On the other hand, of course, uh, uh, you know, taking again this whole word of srijan that Sumita raised earlier. In fact, I wanted to say that srijan is the word that comes to mind. Uh, I'm fortunate to be in, in, a, in a, an industry or in a business where there is a lot of creativity, where there is a lot of scope for creativity. And uh, sometimes when we want to scale and do mass production, timelines, that, that goes away, both from myself as well as from artisans. You know, that, so how does one ma manage to find that time for, for, to stop and think and wonder and create again rather than just be pushed by deadlines, which is also necessary. So, so that's something which is a loss in a way. Yes, please. Uh, on HR, I just wanted to... Yes. Narrator experience. HR is very important, but if you look at the people there as the HR, yeah. then you have a different perspective. 
just want to give one example. In Andhra Pradesh, about uh, six years ago, we started a program of sustainable agriculture intervention. That means agriculture without using chemical pesticides and reducing chemical fertilizers gradually, without affecting yields, without bringing down costs and increasing incomes. We just started with 200 farmers in the year 2004-05. And from these farmers, those who are the best practitioners became the trainers for the newer villages. So with 200 farmers, in 2010-11, we were able to reach out to 1 million farmers. And their extension agents are the best practicing farmers themselves. You do need a small number of you know, people who have passion and also some technical skills but it depends on who you regard as the HR. So the people who are going to be impacted by this process, they are the best HR, and they are available everywhere. So I don't see this as a, as a problem. I see them as the greatest teachers. And I just want you to compare this one million farmers to another global figure. All over the world, 2009-10, there were 1.2 million certified organic farmers. So in Andhra Pradesh, we'll perhaps reach 4 million farmers in another 3-4 years. So you have scale. As I said, depends on who does it. Right. And what is the role of other uh, support organizations. So they themselves become the best ambassadors for change. Yes. Because they're living it, so they're experiencing it firsthand. Yes. Is that what you find in not just agriculture, but uh, in every way? Everywhere. We now have in, I mean, again in Andhra Pradesh, because that's where I worked yes. for about 25 years. Yes. So we have 17 different sectors which have grown through this model. Hmm. And we have in one district a health insurance model run by the District Women's Federation. It doesn't depend on an insurance company. They collect about 260 rupees per family, per annum, across members of five. And they have put in place a beautiful system, and they have been earning profits from year one. In fact, I was nervous when they took up this health insurance, so I kept aside some money in case they make losses for the first two, three years. Mm -hmm. But I found that I didn't have to you know, spend that money. So it's not just in one sector. It's can be done in uh, Across any sector. Here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I believe things like this are very important, partly because, uh, you know, as a democratic country, the single biggest issue as a country we probably face is the inequity that is there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and it comes back from the premise, you need free markets and capitalism so that the country gets more prosperous, but at the same time, you have uh, this whole inequity. <clears throat> you know, and uh, it becomes very, very Im important that in whatever activity we do, we give access of opportunity to all, and uh, whatever the entrepreneurs will be very, very successful, but at the same time, it should go towards making the country a better place, and the country has had great successes. The cell phone revolution has given access to people to communication very cheap. Our rates are probably among the cheapest in the world. Uh, I think broadly on the roads and infrastructure, this private participation, etc., is helping. But um, it becomes very, very incumbent on government to make sure there's access of opportunity and reducing the inequity uh, happens going forward.